Aortic aneurysm. Scary word. We're going to find out what it is, how to find out if you have one, how to treat it, and sort of what's involved with dealing with an aortic aneurysm. Welcome to Talking with Docs. I'm Dr. Paul Zalzal. I'm Dr. Brad Weening. I'm Dr. Brad Chan. First of all, to our viewers, you're doing the right thing. Congratulations. You're watching a video about your health. That's amazing. This is a good use of screen time. Kids, this does not count in your screen time limit for the day. Well done. So Paul Dr. has become your parent as of right now. That's right. But Dr. Chan is a vascular surgeon and she has kindly given us some of her time and expertise to talk to you about aneurysm. So let's start at the beginning. Bev, what is an aneurysm? An aneurysm is when there's an outpouching, so a weakness in the vessel wall. Yep. Um, and so it stretches out to about two times normal size. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, an outpouching or stretching out of a vessel wall. And the one we're going to talk about today, I think mostly is the aortic aneurysm. So the aort, your biggest artery uh, that runs out of your heart and down your whole body and feeds the blood to the different parts of your body. So your aorta and I think we're going to focus on uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms. That's the most common one. Okay, what's the deal? So this happens because, and everyone always is like, well, well how do I get this? And most of the time, 90% is because of degeneration. So think of as your body is aging, it's not only your skin that's getting more lax and things like that. Same thing happens to the vessels. So the elastin inside the the vessel wall, it actually decreases. And so that's how you get that weakening of the vessel wall. So that's 90%. So beauty is not only skin deep. Yeah. No, it's vessel deep for sure. <laughs> and so, so aging is one thing that obviously we can't really control because we're all yeah. gonna slowly get older. Are there any uh, identifiable risk factors or things that people can potentially change throughout their lives to reduce the risk of getting something like this? Yeah, so most risk factors are not changeable. Okay. Um, so age can't really reverse aging process. Uh, sex, right? So men are three to four more times more than females going to get aneurysms. Um, the one thing that can be changed is smoking history. So if you've ever smoked even like one package of cigarettes in your lifetime, then you're already at risk. Okay, so if you've ever had a good reason not to start smoking, this is it. It increases your risk of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Yeah. On the smoking side, if you had one pack of cigarettes and are still a smoker, is it still worthwhile quitting from a vascular surgery yeah. perspective? Okay. So I'll have patients who uh, quit smoking and they have an aneurysm, we follow them. And then I'll have the almost the same person, and but they're continuing to smoke. Yeah. They're the ones where the aneurysms are like crazy. Right, so they get worse. Yeah, so right. I'm like, okay, we'll fix those ones faster. Right. Brad, you I seem guess. worried about that one pack of smoking <laughs> history in you know, a lifetime. You, know what? you seem <laughs> oddly nervous about that. I'm I'm definitely not nervous about it, okay. but I'd say for full disclosure and honesty in our channel, which you have, I've made some bad choices in my life, and I'd say smoking a couple of cigarettes when I was younger would be part of them, for sure. I think telling everyone that's a bad choice, too. You know, I'm comfortable with that, because I don't do it anymore, and you know what? It shows that we're not perfect. We are fallible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Listen, Moving on. I don't, I don't consume the chicken wings that Dr. Zalza does, so my non-smoking now is no. probably going to outweigh that. I'm pretty sure the kale outweighs the there smoking. It's a wash. It's a wash. It's, it's a wash. wash. It's a wash. <laughs> All right. So we've got some risk factors for an aortic aneurysm. Are there any symptoms? of an aortic aneurysm before it starts leaking or ruptures? Most patients will have no symptoms. So they're like walking around like a ticking time bomb. So I would say majority, if they're already symptomatic, so if they're already having like new back pain, abdominal pain, that's already when, you know, it's expanding. It's at risk of rupture. Okay, silent kill. Some people talk about maybe feeling something kind of their heart pounding in their stomach. Is that a real thing? Can be. But it'd have to be pretty big at that yeah. point. Yeah. Okay. So, so now you've gone to your family doctor for some other reason potentially. Yeah. Someone's done a physical examination or another test like a CT scan or ultrasound yeah. for another reason. They've seen this. So what, what's the normal size of your abdominal aorta? So 1.5 centimeters. 1.5 centimeters. That's the diameter. Diameter. Okay. And at what point do we start thinking, or what time, at what point do we call it? Three centimeters. Three centimeters. Okay. So you got a three centimeter abdominal aortic aneurysm. Now what do you do? Now you're nervous, obviously. Yeah. Do you automatically get referred to a vascular surgeon? Most of the times, yeah. Yeah, okay. So you, you get referred to a vascular surgeon. Someone comes in your office with, a, say, a diagnosis of this. Yeah. What do we do then? So it depends what it looks like. Okay. Okay. Um, look at their risk factors. Yep. Get their like blood, blood pressures controlled and things like that. 
um, then it's 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 surveillance. Okay. So we would do either an annual ultrasound, depending on the size. Once it gets pretty big, yep. then we'll reduce it to like every six months screening, um, like surveillance for with ultrasounds. Okay. Because um, we want to kind of get to that size threshold where we're like, eh, I think it's time to to offer surgery. You ran through a few, uh, we talked a few about some of the risk yeah. factors, but now that they're in front of you in the office and you're trying to identify some risk factors, so one is smoking, mm -hmm. one is family history, mm -hmm. uh, do, and you mentioned hypertension, is that a risk factor? Yeah. Hypertension, diabetes, is that a Diabetes, surprisingly protective. Really? Against, yeah. Holy We smoke. don't love to mention it because obviously, yeah. we don't you don't, it's yet. not like you want to wow. get diabetes to prevent aneurysms. Okay, okay. Since we're <laughs> on the prevention thing, yeah. yeah. What, what about high cholesterol, yeah. There's high yeah. cholesterol? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's so a risk factor. So coronary disease. Okay. Um, yeah. Eating connected chicken wings. Tissues, chicken wings. Disease. Is that protective? No. Okay. So connective <laughs> tissue disease. Yeah. Okay. That's a risk factor as well. And height is a risk factor too. So the taller you are, you're also uh, at risk. Higher risk. Yeah. Right? Holy yeah. smokes. Okay. Yeah. So these Which are. Which is weird. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll take it. <laughs> so these are these are the things that you look for when you're taking a history. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, anything else? Cover all the risks. No. On so for the sizes, we have small, medium, and large. Correct. So the three to 4.5, 4.5 yeah. to 5.5, 5, and then greater than 5.5 centimeters, is yeah. that still used? So men and women are different. Okay. Okay. We so. sure are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So men, 5.5 is when our, our guidelines say to treat them in men. Regardless of symptoms. Yeah. You have no symptoms, 5.5, yeah. it's dangerous. And then looking at their other health factors, like can they withstand a big surgery? Right. Are they gonna, you know, do they have metastatic cancer? Or they're not sure. Gonna, so then we're kind of like, well, are yep. they? Uh, females is smaller. Okay. So five centimeters. Okay. So a lot of people are like, oh yeah, you guys are just surgeons. You just want to yeah. operate on all these aneurysms. The reason that 5.5 centimeters or five centimeters in female was chosen is because your risk of rupture is much higher. And once it ruptures, your odds of successful treatment goes way, way down. Most this, only, yeah, if it ruptures. Right? 80%. So, yeah, 80% aren't even going to make it to hospital. Fatal. So if yeah. your aneurysm ruptures, you have an 80% chance of not surviving the event. So we always talk about risk benefit ratio. So those numbers, five yeah. and five point five, were found out through good studies to show that look, the risk of rupture is now getting higher than the risk of surgery, which tips the risk benefit ratio in the favor of surgery at that level or more, because it can be potentially life saving. So now we've talked about the history, the, the look for the risk factors, some sizes on physical exam. If someone comes into your office, what do you what do you look for on physical examination? Just feeling their belly and feeling if they if you can feel like a pulsatile mass. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, palpation of the abdomen and see if you can feel a pulsatile mass. I did find one once when I was a resident. I remember we were rotating through and it was like abdominal pain and it was a leaking one. So that is uh -huh. that is a physical examination thing that you're vascular surgeon or even family doctor or primary care physician oh, is going to sure. do to, to try and find this out. And then we said we ordered the ultrasound. Is that your yeah. thing of choice, yeah. screening of choice? It's, it's, not, it's cheap for the government right. and it, it pick high pickup rate and it doesn't have any radiation involved. So right. then you're not worried about... Actually, we have an ultrasound I, b ah. because of a family. <laughs> One of the three of us has had an ultrasound. It, I honestly, it just it. dawned on me because I have a family history. Uh, so my family doctor sent yeah. me for an ultrasound, which I'll, I'll show everybody. An ultrasound is a non-invasive test, like you mentioned, using sound waves that are higher than the frequencies we can hear. Humans can hear 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Ultrasound is anything higher than that. And, and they use it to get an image inside your body without invading your body. And you get the gel put on. The so. gel is an acoustic coupling gel okay. because sound waves will bounce back from any okay. interface. And it was a relatively short test, Paul, and, uh, and yeah. no, no pain, obviously. That's right. That's right. So I'm going to show you this okay. video. However, I just want to say beforehand, since I'm doting my body to science here. Yes, thank you. Be because of the angle of the camera, I'm like holding it like this. It, it makes it look like my abdomen is very hairy. So I don't want to <laughs> show... I don't want any jokes. Oh my goodness. I don't need Sasquatch sighting <laughs> jokes or any part Chia pet joke. I don't expect it from Dr. Chan because I anticipate her Being brand of humor is a little more sophisticated yeah, than ours. Okay. Well, let's have a look. Okay. And, you know, let's let the viewers judge. It's an optical illusion. Ultrasound table here, and I've got Samira, the ultrasound technician. Hi, Samira. Hi. And she just brings some gel on my abdomen. 
And then she's gonna have, a, that's the ultrasound probe going on it. And you can see the ultrasound probe is pushing down while she's trying to get some images. She's done my whole abdomen and now she's just focusing on the aorta, which is why I'm here for a screening test. Samira, is my six pack abs getting in the way of the filming? No, not really. Not really? Oh, okay, that's too bad. Oh, am I pregnant? No. We would both be rich. <laughs> we would both be rich, she said. I guess that was my heartbeat going. So that's your proximal iota. Okay, so that's the Doppler ultrasound. Measuring the flow of my proximal aorta. So she's moving down and it's a pretty firm push. It's not uncomfortable, but you can feel it. So really nothing to be afraid of if you have to go get an ultrasound. Okay, so what? Remember you were in a sweater during I the test. I was not wearing a sweater. I told you it was an optical <laughs> illusion because it's camera trickery. <clears throat> not to mention the gel. That's like Brill cream for the abdomen. All right. Okay, so that is an abdominal ultrasound. Add right. that to the list of things you can't unsee about Dr. Zalzer, like him in his bath when we were doing our okay. magnesium salts video. <laughs> I withdraw my consent. I withdraw my consent for that video. Next time you watch this video, it's not going to be me in there getting an ultrasound. It's good to be there. Okay, so now we have the diagnosis. So let's talk about treatment. So the first group of people that gets treated are the people that have aneurysms that are large enough that their risk of rupture is high. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the elective procedure. So what, what do we do for this? There's different types of surgeries. There is the traditional open surgery, so okay. that's where we make the incision. We would clamp above and below the aneurysm and replace that segment with a plastic tube graft okay. and then sew it back. So that's the traditional method. There's a newer method, um, and that was started back in 1991 um, by a seventh. Newer, 31 years old. I, that's that's, that's how that's the face of medicine, right? right? Like, wow. And then Canada takes forever. That's before the internet. <laughs> insane. Okay. Newer. So the newer one is the endovascular repair. So these are stent covered stent grafts that are, are put in um, through the groin. So with little small incisions. Um, and that's, that's a easier procedure for patients to tolerate. And usually with those ones that are in and out of hospital within two days. Probably. So very exciting for patients and for yeah. surgeons. Yeah. Because the yeah. success rate is so much, yeah. much less invasive. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the success rates for these surgeries are typically they're good. Um, so short term, in terms of open surgery, so if you look at the literature, 30 day outcomes, less than 5% risk of mortality with okay. the open surgeries, 10% okay. um, morbidity. So if they have like a heart attack after surgery, have to go on dialysis, if they have like breathing issues, stroke. So that's with the open surgery. With the endovascular repair, it's about less than 1% wow. chance of mortality. The only thing is like it's still a discussion between the surgeon and the patient in terms of which method is better, depending on the anatomy, how the whole aorta is angulated. Some, Does it relate to how close it is to the kidneys? Like it is, super yeah, renal. yeah. So there are fancier, newer uh, stent grafts right. that can get closer to the kidneys, okay, um, and custom grafts as well. So there, I think I read where you can have like little open yeah. to the celiac or the yeah. superior mesenteric or the renals. So for our some patients, there is one company that will take your CT scan and make a custom graft that is only for you. Right. Uh, it takes about six weeks though. Wow. Yeah. And the graft is made out of? It, it's like a, a Gore-Tex okay. uh, for, the, for the actual material. And then to actually reinforce that, they're nitinal stents that's basically like hand sewn into them. So, so if yeah. I can understand, so you're taking this graft, yeah. you're putting it through a small hole in the groin, getting it to where it needs to be, and then how do you make sure, how does it A, stay where it's supposed to be, and how do you, how do you advance it? Is this on the end of a catheter or like? 
So it's all like, so the graphs are then, like after it's made, it's smushed in and put into these deploying devices. Okay. Um, so it's kind of like a parachute when okay. you deploy it out and you kind of like open it. Um, how it stays is at the top, depending on the manufacturer, everybody has their own kind of like sure. secrets. Um, <laughs> but most of the time they have like little hooks on the end to, to, to grab onto the wall of the healthy aorta to kind of you know, get it to stay in place. Right. Um, other methods, there's like some ones that like use a glue sealant. And, and how long like does that. this procedure take? On like average? About an hour and a half. Okay, so it's pretty yeah. fast. Wow, it's incredibly yeah. innovative to, yeah. to solve that medical problem. And, and you can see that the innovation of these uh, less invasive techniques uh, reduce your mortality and your morbidity. So mortality, your risk of dying from the procedure and morbidity, risk of something bad happening from the procedure go way down with these less invasive techniques, which makes sense because we're not making a large incision to get at the aorta. We're just making tiny incisions and putting the instruments and devices in through little holes in your your body instead of like a you yeah. know, 18 inch incision. But it's important to address the main risk or main uh, morbidity related to these procedures is all about blood supply. So to your heart, heart attack, yeah. to your brain stroke, to your kidneys dialysis, to your stomach potentially. Yeah. You could have ischemic colon oh, disease. For sure. for sure. These are, and these are not unfortunately totally uncommon, but it is the nature of the operation. Yeah. It's not because something went wrong. It's because you have a very difficult problem to solve. For, for sure. Okay. So how long, let's say I've had a repair, am I cured? or um, does this have a lifespan? Great question. So we can see no matter what, even if it was an open repair versus an endovascular repair, sometimes over time we see the aorta above it. So okay. the healthy, that what used to be the healthy aorta yes. can then degenerate into an aneurysm. Right. Okay, so we can see that. Um, with the stent grafts, we are monitoring that a lot more closely compared to the open, because there's about a 15 to 20% re-intervention rate with the stent graft. So there is some caveats with the newer technology, um, for sure. Okay. And then with the open repair, usually we'd have to do a CT scan at least every five years, just to make sure we're not seeing new aneurysms. Okay, so you can have an aneurysm above your graft or below your graft? In your on your own tissue or uh, even with the less invasive ones yeah. they may need some more intervention some parts might get occluded yeah. and you may need another intervention yeah. afterwards so nothing lasts forever uh, but it's as close to a cure as you can get yeah. uh, if you have this condition yeah. for sure there's another group of people i'd like to talk about so the symptomatic group yeah so first the symptoms of a rupture are relatively straightforward you have drastically reduced yeah. blood supply to your entire body so severe pain weakness, dizziness, fainting, you would pass out. Yeah. Right. But what about the person that has a leaky uh, aortic aneurysm? So maybe just a small little leak. Yeah. So they'll still have abdominal pain or right. back pain. And it's, uh, patients will tell us that it's different from their usual back pain. So okay. it's something that doesn't go away okay. completely. And they just feel a little bit off and usually it's our non-complainers and it's like their family member right. like yeah you know what my dad never complains like about a pain. farmer yeah yeah and they're like oh finally <laughs> get them in you're like oh they're leaking yeah okay so you've heard a lot about aneurysms yeah. and the symptoms that causes the severity the fact that you can die from it what you're probably wondering now is well how do i know if i have one should i go get screened for it should i go get tested let's talk about that the average person one of our viewers well, I was wondering, well, what sh how do I know whether or not I should go get tested for an aneurysm? So guidelines, so Canadian Society for Vascular Surgery has screening guidelines out there. Um, so any man who is 65 years or older should have at least a one-time ultrasound to look for it. Okay. Um, if there is family history, I should be screened younger. So between 50 to 55 should have at least a one-time ultrasound. Uh, for females, they say if it's 65 years or older, and if they've had a history of smoking, like even one package of cigarettes, family history, if they have other risk factors. So like your high blood pressure, cerebral vascular, like brain uh, okay. things, strokes. Okay, so yeah. if you're watching and you're a male over 65, you should get an ultrasound screening. Yes. If you are a female with even one pack of smoking history, 
over what yeah. age was it? 65. 65, 65. 65. You should get screened. Yeah. And then women, in the absence of the other risk factors, over 70, yeah. should get screened as well. And that's the Canadian guidelines. Are yeah. the American guidelines similar? Are they a little more aggressive? They're in a little screen? bit more aggressive. Okay, they're a little bit more aggressive in the US uh, for, for getting screened. So those are guidelines that we follow in Canada. Uh, in other parts of the world, it yeah. may be different. If you're worried about it, definitely go speak to your primary care physician, your healthcare provider, and just say, look, here's my life, here's my history, should I get screened for it? That is such a great summary of the triple, triple A, it sounds like it's so good, like A, yeah. A, A. Yeah, I play triple A baseball, amazing. I have a triple A in my admin. Look out. Yeah, so um, take this information, use it as you require, share it with people that you know that do have this issue, and if you like this video, please like it, subscribe to our channel. And by the way, my <laughs> ultrasound screening was negative. Oh, okay, well that's okay. good. Thanks that's for good. asking. Good. Thanks, did for, they your, say it had thanks to be, for your concern. Did they say it had to be redone because of the hair that was still a reliable test? The hair did not play an issue. <laughs> the acoustic coupling gel acted like an abdominal brill cream. It made it look a lot worse than it is. I'll take my shirt off right now. <laughs> and remember, you are in charge of your own health. And thanks so much to Dr. Chan for giving us this explanation. Okay. No, thank you. We'll see you next time. <laughs>